Noah's Ark. You may order a copy of this program through arcdiscovery.com. See arcdiscovery.com to become a direct seller of this DVD. Join us now as we begin Revealing God's Treasure. Noah's Ark. Before the great flood, the world had become filled with wicked men, so much so that the Lord decided to destroy the face of the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. The Lord chose Noah, a man of God, to build an ark in which the righteous would be saved along with some of the animals. Noah preached of conversion and repentance for 120 years, but only eight people gave their hearts to the Lord and entered the ark. The rain came and the people sought the safety of higher ground or the ark itself, but the angel of the Lord had closed the door of the ark and it could not be opened. Probation had closed. It was too late. Death and destruction covered the earth. The thoughts of man were evil continually. God extended an invitation, but it was not accepted. This was a judgment of man. All the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, God had saved his people through the flood, but they would spend almost one year in the ark, waiting for the floodwaters to recede and new life to begin. Noah and his family were anxious to leave the ark. Finally, Noah knew it was safe to leave. He offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and the Lord placed a bow of promise in the sky that he would never again destroy the earth with a flood. The Bible tells us where the Ark of Noah came to rest. The Ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. But what is Ararat? The name Ararat, as it appears in the Bible, is the Hebrew equivalent of Urartu, ancient country of Southwest Asia mentioned in Assyrian sources from the early 13th century BC. This area included parts of Eastern Turkey, Armenia, and Iran. Moses was not speaking of a specific mountain when writing Genesis. He was speaking of a country, Urartu. 
So the Bible was saying the ark came to rest in the mountains of the country of Urartu. In eastern Turkey, across the valley from Mount Ararat, is the site we will be visiting. This area was first photographed in an aerial survey conducted in 1959 by Francis Gary Powers. Later, Turkish Lieutenant Duripinar spotted the boat-shaped object in these photographs. So in 1960, a group from the United States journeyed to the site, but they prematurely concluded it was just a natural formation. That same year, Life magazine featured photos of the site. Is there a historical record from ancient civilizations of Noah's Ark existing? Barosis the Chaldean wrote, It is said there is still some part of the ship in Armenia, at the mountain of the Chordeans, and some people carry off pieces of the bitumen, which they take away, and use chiefly as amulets, for the averting of mischiefs. Today, we can look at a map of Turkey, and see this site listed as Nuhun Jimisi, or Noah's Big Boat. Making the trip to the site, we landed next to the very large Lake Vaughan, which once hosted the ancient capital of Urartu named Tushpa, located along its shore. Heading out through the countryside, we see an extinct volcano. Crossing a mountain, we soon see our first glimpse of the famous Mount Ararat in the distance. In the shadows of Ararat is the city of Dobayazit that we pass through, heading toward the Noah's Ark site. Mount Ararat is a beautiful mountain, complete with a rich history of mountain climbers searching for the Ark, but without success. Across the valley, we stop and see the government-erected road sign, Nohan Jimisi, five kilometers up the mountain. On Ron Wyatt's first trip to the region in 1977, he didn't know where to begin searching, and he only had three days in the area. So he and his teenage sons prayed that their taxi would stall in areas where they needed to search. That day, God stalled their taxi in three different locations. And here is our first taxi stop. High on the mountain is the resting place of Noah's ship. The name of this mountain is translated as Doomsday Mountain, named so for the deadly event of the flood. As we drive up the mountain, we can see Lesser Ararat and Greater Ararat across the valley. Both are post-flood volcanic mountains that were not even here during the flood, and they would be the last place one should search for the Ark. We finally made it to the Ark. Looking at it from the stern, or rear, one can see the boat-shaped outline of the Ark. It has a rounded stern and a pointed bow or front. The symmetrical shape indicates that it is a man-made structure, Ron Wyatt made 24 trips out here to conduct tests and do research at this boat-shaped formation. Photos taken at different times of the year have brought out different features of the boat. There was so much convincing evidence uncovered at the site that the Turkish government declared this area to be Noah's Ark National Park. And yet today, the world is unaware of this amazing discovery. Using Google Earth, we can zoom in on the site with satellite imagery to see the Ark and also the visitor center that was constructed by the Turkish government. It was on June 21, 1987, that a ceremony was held on the mountain to commemorate the site as Noah's Ark National Park. Dignitaries from around the country assembled to break bread and celebrate this wonderful find. The governor, military officers, and other key officials were participating in a celebration of discovery. Ron Wyatt was a special guest because of the extensive work that he had accomplished at the site. The visitor center would welcome guests from around the world to gaze upon the ark. As concrete was placed in the foundation by the governor and by Ron Wyatt, excitement was in the air. This was a monument to the mortal remains of Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark was found. 
The next day, an article appeared in Turkey's largest newspaper announcing Noah's Big Boat, open for tourism. Now, we make our way inside the visitor center to view the informative evidence on display. Various diagrams and photos are assembled to point out the important features of the Ark. Specimens from the Ark are also on display, including petrified wood and sea fossils from the area, which indicate this mountain is water-laid rock. A guest book shows us that people are visiting the site from all over the world. Many different countries are represented here. Hassan Ozer has worked in the visitor center since it opened. He has lived his entire life in a village here on the mountain, just above the Ark, and has a great deal of history associated with the Ark. His photo appeared in a Knoxville, Tennessee newspaper, so our team brought him a laminated copy for his own. Hassan now tells us some interesting history about the Ark formation. <laughs> Bunu gemisi var ya, de 1948 senesinde gece bir kayma deprem oldu. Sabahleyin vakti ki her taraf gitmiş, bunun gemisi bir oda güçlüğüne kalmıştır. Her akşam üzerine bir elektrik lambası gibi iş kıyın aldı. Bilmeyeceğim. In 1948, there was an earthquake and it was in the night time. And we just wake up in the morning and we see the earth was moved and we saw the shape like an ark. Ah, the Bali bir pilot tarafında bunu fotoğrafı çekiyor. Gidiyor Ankara. Also, uh, after uh, that time, there was a uh, light we can could see in the night time in the uh, up on the village when we look uh, down to the outside and people was uh, believing that uh, it's holy uh, things and they when they uh, come on to the next to the ark this uh, light is going off you know you cannot find no gibi bir şahsi olarak benim kendi şahsi olarak ben de hem inanıyorum hem de karar veriyorum çünkü neden her taraf gitti nuhun gemisi o böyle ada gibi içinde kaldı her zaman her akşam üzerinde bir ışık yanıyor sarı yeşil kırmızı kimse yüzü böyle bir ziyaret etmiş bir türbe kimse bir hazine eder ama araştırma yapadıktan sonra izin arada kayboldu gitti ben oynuyorum size de bir daha var söyle onu söyle say that uh, if in, in my personal uh, thinking is uh, well i see after the uh, this earthquake there is a uh, shape like a arc and uh, also there was a light which is colored light uh, uh, green, yellow, and reddish uh, uh, lights we saw there, and uh, lots of people were in the village. They were uh, saying that's the holy place. Somebody says that there, uh, there is a uh, some gold we should go uh, dig it up and stuff like this. They say especially when you come next to it, it's going uh, off. The light you cannot see anymore. But he said after the. Uh, the government confirmed that that's the Noah's Ark. There is no light anymore, and uh, you know uh, that's that's make me uh, think it is Noah's Ark. Do you believe Noah's Ark actually existed? Could the legend that sounds like a fairy tale really become proven fact? Well, the search has been going on since biblical times. And in a moment, you're going to meet some people who are positive they have found the Ark. Now, we know such claims have been made before, but a few months ago, these people came to 2020 with some new and intriguing scientific findings. We followed them to the mountains of eastern Turkey. And what you'll see is a bizarre adventure with a host of unlikely characters. Tom Gerald's story takes many twists and turns. That's the seductive beauty that brings them here, snow-capped Mount Ararat. The explorers looked for the ark there since that's the highest point around here. And as the flood waters receded, presumably that's where it would have landed. 
But the Bible describes the mountains of Ararat, mountains, plural. Is it possible that the ark came to rest on one of the smaller sister mountains to Ararat? The boat-shaped site was first found and photographed by a Turkish army captain back in 1959. It was quickly explored and dismissed as a freak of nature. But Wyatt, an amateur archaeologist, rekindled interest in it a few years ago. He brought in Dave Fassel, a marine salvage expert, to assess it. The Doomsday Mountain team brought in some high technology to explore the oldest legend of man. They began scanning their site with a molecular frequency generator. It's a device used by surgeons to pinpoint cancer tumors, and it's been used by Fassel to locate underwater treasure. This time, the molecular frequency generator began to pick up a unique pattern of iron lines beneath the earth. Okay, bring that one up. They began placing ribbons along those lines. The finished shape outlined by the ribbons was that of a huge ship, the approximate length and width of Noah's Ark, as described in the Bible. The fascinating field of ribbons soon oh, attracted higher thing. academic that interest. Right. That looks like iron. Okay. Dr. John Baumgartner, a physicist with Los Alamos Laboratories, sent samples back to the lab for analysis and confirmed that the metal they were tracing with the ribbons was indeed iron. With the width and the length known, the only remaining question was depth. By locating the depth of the hull, they could determine if the boat-shaped object had the cargo capacity described in the biblical ark. To resolve this final issue, Wyatt and Fassel brought geologist Tom Finner to Turkey with his company's heavy-duty subsurface radar equipment. Gear like this located the black box cockpit recorder on the floor of the frozen Potomac River after the Air Florida crash. Suppose this rock were a foot or two feet underground. Would it give you a reading as to where that was? Could you locate it? Yes, we could. Is it possible that there will be a moment at which you'll say, this is a man-made object? Uh, the symmetry of the feature suggests it's about, um, I hope to prove that the underground structure is in fact that of a boat. It was here, several miles short of the boat-shaped site, that a waiting game began for Fenner and the others. The party needed a final go-ahead from the Turkish government to complete their probe of Doomsday Mountain. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to hang in like a smell on a skunk till there's nothing left to get this done. Hang in like the smell in the sky. The Turkish government stopped the, the exploration. What now? Since we were there, Barbara, things have cooled down, and they've sent their own team of scientists in to take a look at this site. It's a very fascinating location. Ground-penetrating radar was used on the formation to see what is inside. The reflections created a picture of timbers underground. This diagram shows us some of the main structural elements of the arc including parallel and repeated patterns, indicating a man-made site. Indeed, there is something beneath that rock besides rock. A radar device developed by Geophysical Survey Systems in Hudson was used on the mountain. The device called SIR is used by energy exploration companies to analyze what's below the Earth's surface. According to SIR, something man-made is under Mount Aridog. This data is not it does not represent natural geology. It's, it's a man-made structure. These reflections are occurring very per periodic, too periodic to be random nat natural type interface. Compared to an aircraft carrier 1,000 feet long, we can see the ark is quite large. The Ark was a high-tech vessel that was designed to survive a catastrophic flood that would destroy the surface of the Earth. Complete with a keel, keelsons, and anchor stones, it was truly a work of art designed to save the human race from annihilation. The Bible tells us the Ark was 300 cubits in length. The Ark formation has been measured to be 515 feet long, which is exactly 300 Egyptian cubits. Moses, when writing the Genesis account, would have been accustomed to using the longer Egyptian cubit of 20.6 inches. The Bible mentions an earlier cubit, cubits according to the former measure. This references the Egyptian cubit, which was divided into 28 digits, making up the cubit rod. Many centuries later, the 18-inch Hebrew cubit was developed and implemented. At the Tel Megiddo in Israel, Solomon's gates can be measured to exactly six Egyptian cubits, 
showing further evidence of its early usage. One can easily see the rib timbers near the stern on the starboard side of the ark. This was part of the superstructure of the ark, much like ships are constructed today. Horizontal boards would have been attached to these vertical ribs. Here we can see vertical fissures between the ribs. These ribs run perpendicular to the mud flow around the structure, indicating once again, man-made construction. Local village boys greet us as we take a look at the starboard side of the ark, which curves uphill toward the front of the ark. This side is predominantly buried in the soil. The outside of the bow, or front, is just before us, and then we scan down the starboard side to see the top of the rib timbers. In the distance, we can see Mount Ararat and Lesser Ararat. We now pan over to the port side of the ark near the stern. This side is less preserved, but we can see one large rib timber standing at attention. It has been beautifully preserved and has retained the curvature of the hull. From here, we look toward the front of the ark and we can see a large hole which was blown open in 1960 when the first group came here from the United States to inspect the site. We are now standing on the middle deck of the ark and now pan over to the interior of the port side, where we can see four horizontal protrusions in a row. They are arranged in a regular pattern, indicating man-made construction. These would have been horizontal deck support timbers, extending toward the middle of the deck. At the stern, we can see the symmetrical shape of the boat, including the center mound, where the decks have collapsed one on top of another. Continuing to inspect the stern, we can see five objects in a row along the inside port area of the deck. These have been measured at regular intervals and appear to be vertical posts that would have supported the deck. The ark originally came to rest higher on the mountain, but was pulled down to its current location amidst a lava or mud flow which impaled it on this rock outcropping. Ron Wyatt was operating his ground-penetrating equipment before Turkish authorities when he spotted an object just below the surface. What they found was this beautiful deck timber. It was tested at Galbraith Labs for organic carbon. The level of organic carbon was extremely high, thus proving this object was once living matter consistent with wood. Mr. Wyatt was able to display the deck timber on CNN when he was interviewed on their network. The timber is in three layers, much like plywood, with glue oozing out at the end. This makes it stronger than one solid piece of wood. The outer area is covered in black pitch. Some nails can also be seen on its surface. This layering of wood may have been the gopher wood mentioned in Genesis. Just above the Ark site is the Uzengili village. Its former name in the 19th century was Naser. This pronunciation is similar to Nicer, a village that the Babylonian Barosis described as being near the Ark site. Josephus in the first century said, its remains are shown there by the inhabitants to this day. This would tell us the Ark would be in an accessible location these local villagers would have had a tourist trade accommodating visitors to the Ark. The visitors to the Ark would have stayed overnight here and would have bought souvenirs in the village. Evidence of this was discovered in 2000 when an archaeologist found this potser 20 yards from the Ark. On the concave side, it has a carving of a man using a hammer to drive a nail, much like Noah building the Ark. On the convex side, an ancient ink drawing shows a man releasing birds matching the biblical narrative of Noah releasing a raven and a dove. This is just another piece of amazing evidence found here at the Ark site. Using radar equipment, Ron Wyatt discovered an open cavity on the starboard side of the Ark. Utilizing a core drilling technique, he was able to gain access to the interior of the Ark. Stunning evidence was pulled from the belly of the ship. 
Using an improvised long rake device, petrified animal dung was extracted from the hull. Next, cat hair was also pulled from the cavity. Then, a petrified antler was extracted. These are all items that one would expect to find in the bottom of the ark. The Bible tells us the antediluvians were skilled in metalworking. Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. This large metal rivet, or metal washer around a metal rod, was found by Ron Wyatt when he had taken a tour group to the site in 1991. The center rod had been struck while it was hot, causing it to flare out, holding the washer in place. Test results showed that it contained 8% aluminum metal. Aluminum metal is man-made, thus proving the site to be man-made. Skeptics have said Mr. Wyatt was lying about the testing, but was he really? When the Ark Discovery International team was at the Ark site, they used a metal detector to locate metal fittings on the Ark. This is a crescent-shaped piece of metal that had been a circular washer in its better days and was found near the bow on the port side. A portion of it tested at Galbraith Labs in Tennessee, and the results were stunning. It was 8% aluminum metal, just as Ron White's test had revealed. The test additionally showed a small amount of titanium metal that is also man-made. The Ark Discovery team continued its analysis at the site and located another fitting on the starboard side. A portion of it was sent to Galbraith Labs for testing, and again, there were incredible results. It contained 8% aluminum metal, 1.3% titanium metal, plus 3.8% magnesium metal, all indicative of the Ark formation being a man-made structure. The Encyclopedia Britannica tells us, because of its chemical activity, aluminum never occurs in the metallic form in nature. These unique metal components are special markers that were left behind which proved the site is without a doubt a man-made structure utilizing high-tech construction techniques consistent with what we should find in Noah's Ark. Modern man didn't discover how to make aluminum metal until around 1900, but the antediluvians had this knowledge in their day. Other metal fittings were found on the port side of the deck. Our metal detector picked up metal readings where a rectangular plate was positioned on a flat plane. This plate originally had six rivets, one is still visible on the left side. Other metal fittings can be seen around the Ark in various locations. The metal fittings have different colors from the surrounding material, making it easier to locate them at the site. On the outer portion of the Ark, at a higher level, we were able to see this object that appears to be a metal cap on top of a vertical post. It has an X impression embossed in the center of it. The left side of the cap is missing, but the top and this immediate side are still affixed to the post. The X impression is indicative of a man-made structure with the 90 degree angles. Our second taxi stop is the village of Kazan, where large anchor stones can be found that once hung from the rear of the Ark. Just down the valley from Noah's Ark, we come to the village of Kazan, where portions of the Ark's directional system were released, thus allowing the Ark to float more freely. This village was known as the Place of the Eight, named so for the eight survivors of the Flood. This is the first area that Noah and his family lived after the Flood. The large anchor stones were hung from the rear of the Ark to keep the rear facing oncoming waves. It created a type of resistance in the water allowing the rounded rear of the Ark to fend off powerful waves that would critically damage the Ark if struck broadside. This is our first anchor stone. Measuring 11 feet in height, with 4 feet embedded in the ground, it is actually the largest and most beautiful anchor stone found to date. A tapered hole was drilled into the top of each anchor stone, a 5-inch opening on one side and a 7-inch opening on the other allowing a rope to be pulled through and a knot tied. 
It was designed to be lifted while in the water when it would weigh less, thereby preventing the top from breaking off. The most striking feature is the crosses that have been carved on the anchor stone. Early Christians came through this area and recognized these objects as biblical items from the ark. They carved crosses on these anchor stones, representing Noah and his family. The largest cross here represents Noah and is of the Crusader style. The diamond shape with a cross above was Nimrod's sign when he was alive. The diamond represents the ark that he took credit for. Then the vertical line is the pathway to heaven, with the crossbar representing heaven. The Egyptians had an adaptation of this symbol called the Ankh. Smaller anchor stones or drogue stones can be found near the Mediterranean. This is one of the largest you will ever see outside the Noah's Ark area. The next anchor stone is partially buried in the ground with five crosses. The largest cross represents Noah. The next smallest, Mrs. Noah. Then the three smallest are the sons of Noah. At the bottom is a possible image of the Tower of Babel, which was built around 200 years after the flood by Nimrod and his rebellious followers. This particular stone has seven crosses, with the eighth having been removed at some point in time. This stone has a large cross, representing Noah. The next smaller cross on the bottom left is Mrs. Noah. The next three smaller crosses represent the three sons. Then, the three smallest represent the wives of the sons. This stone does not have any carvings on it, but it does have a hole drilled through the top. Other stones have been found buried, but they have no inscriptions. This stone had a hole drilled in the left side. Then on the right, we can see ancient inscriptions. Vandals have broken this stone but you can see where the hole once was in the top. Crosses have also been carved on this stone. Five crosses are on this anchor stone. And as we look at the top, we can see where the hole has been broken off. Outside the village of Kazan is a large object that has the appearance of petrified tree bark and with unusual characteristics. As far as we know, there's nothing else like this anywhere. Nobody's ever... Oh my goodness. It's got crosses uh, that crosses? are very faintly carved on it. You got, a big, you got a big one here. You got a small one right there. Mm. One here. One here. They're, get, they're harder to see over here. And this is petrified wood? Well, it looks like it, Ron it? said he thought it was petrified bark. tree bark. Right. If you look at the... You ever seen... It looks like a little bit like pine bark. It sounds like metal. Well, why would the anchor stone be wood? Would this isn't an anchor stone. Oh, oh, I see. This this was just like something that uh, was on the ark, right? Well, Ron <clears throat> theorized that this might have been the or part of the cover. You remember, at one point it says, and uh, uh, Noah came out of the ark and he took the cover off, or he yeah. threw the cover off. He, and of course, that's just speculation. We don't have a way of knowing, but. This is a rather unique thing. It has the appearance and the texture of some kind of a bark, but it, you know it is stone. That is a cross. That is a cross. There you go. That is incredible. It has a very hollow sound. Very hollow. It sounds like metal. But it's just a. Well, it's a. It's just that's its harmonic. Right. Yeah. yeah. Might resonance. You're right. Yeah. But I'm, okay, not, there's not many stones that do that. Let's try it. <coughs> With the sun coming out. There's, well, I think there's eight crosses on it. We've been able to find seven. I think there's an eighth one up there. Our next taxi stop is the home of Noah, near the village of Kazan. This photo was taken in 1977 by Ron Wyatt showing the walls of Noah's home. Since then, all the walls have been torn down by local treasure seekers. In the front yard stood this large tombstone. On the tombstone was a drawing of eight people and a boat on a wave. The second largest person was looking downward with their eyes closed. This indicates that this was Mrs. Noah's tombstone. After Mr. Wyatt showed this to someone, 
That person later hired others to exhume Mrs. Noah's 18-foot sarcophagus. Its depression in the ground is still visible today. Her jewelry was later sold on the black market for millions of dollars. Extending out from Noah's house are these ancient stone fences for containing animals. In Genesis, we are told that Noah practiced husbandry. In this case, we can see signs of animal husbandry. Some fences are more prominent than others, but they are all in straight lines. Uphill, behind Noah's home, is this large altar that he would have used to sacrifice animals to the Lord. It is approximately 10 feet in diameter and has a cube-like shape. In conclusion, we can say that the Durupanar, Noah's Ark formation, is full of evidence which confirms its authenticity, especially when we objectively consider all the information. Many books have been written about the discovery of the Ark. It has been featured in many newspapers and television programs, but most of the world is not aware of this beautiful discovery, which refutes evolution and proves the Bible to be truth. In God's timing, He will reveal this to all mankind. You may order a copy of this program through arcdiscovery.com. See arcdiscovery.com to become a direct seller of this DVD.